to a special edition of the Theater of Public Policy. Here is your host, live at a completely empty and disinfected Bryant Lake Bowl Theater, Dane Danger! the best opening for this show that we have ever had. Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for watching. A big round of applause for everybody watching online right now of uh, Dennis Curley. Wow, that was fantastic. So hi, everyone. My name is Tane Danger, and I am uh, joining you via very unusual circumstances. I am the host of this show called The Theater of Public Policy. And uh, normally what we do is that we talk uh, about a big issue or big idea and uh, we put a, a bunch of very talented improvisers on this stage behind me to listen to that person talk about that big issue or idea. Uh, and then they turn that into unscripted improv comedy theater. And so everybody learns something and everybody laughs and it's very fun. Uh, obviously, we are in very different circumstances these days. And so getting to be together in the same theater, this beautiful theater behind me, the Bright Lake Bowl, uh, it's not something we can do anymore. So uh, we put on our improv brain caps, which are similar to just most brain caps. Uh, but uh, we said, yes, and how can we do this? And so we, as a theater company, have been practicing over the last several days. Can we do our entire show via Zoom conference? Everybody's getting very comfortable with the Zoom now. And so we are going to try and take it to the next level where we right now are all here, the cast of the Theater of Public Policy, me and our guests for this evening, all via conference call. And we are going to attempt to do our show for you watching live at home right now uh, while we are all separated. So I, as was noted, am here at the Bryant Lake Bowl Theater, which unfortunately is closed right now which actually is a very good note for me to tell you all. Bright Lake Bowl uh, would love your support throughout this. That's part of the reason why we're doing this here. Uh, if you are a fan of us or have come to see our shows at the Bright Lake Bowl, you absolutely should go to the Bright Lake Bowl's website. There are things that you can buy there, like these lovely uh, merch items, like these hats or uh, this lovely uh, hoodie that you can get. Or you can just make a donation so that they can keep their staff going, which would be very nice and wonderful. Um, but for tonight, I'm here all alone, but the entire Theater of Public Policy cast is with us, and I am going to turn on gallery view so each of them can introduce themselves. So, without further ado, the, the big round of applause for the cast of the Theater of Public Policy. Do you want to say who you are? Chuck Washington. Brandon Boat. Heather Meyer. Chris Rodriguez. Jim Robinson. Dennis Curley, hello. And then you're seeing down in the corner our guest for this evening, Sharon Steitler, who we're going to get to in just a moment. Uh, and I'm super excited. Uh, let me, I'm going to just say a couple things really quick here at the top. Uh, even though things are uh, unusual, we want to say a big thank you to everybody who's obviously tuning in to watch this special edition of our show. I want to say a big thank you to our, our sponsors all this season. Uh, right now, I am drinking a, uh, again, a very sanitized but very delicious Finnegan's Beer. Finnegan's Beer has been our sponsor all season long and uh, for many years. They right now, because their tap room is closed, are only able to offer curbside pickup. And then obviously you can buy their beer at uh, liquor stores. Please go uh, buy some Finnegan's Beer. Uh, not right now. Keep watching the show. Uh, but afterwards, go buy a Finnegan's Beer. Um, and then MinPost, our media sponsor, has both uh, been helping get the word out about our shows as well as uh, reporting about all of the other things that are happening in Minnesota. You can decide which of those is more important. Uh, but for right now, I am super excited. What are we gonna do? We are going to talk to a brilliant expert uh, about a big issue or idea, and then our cast from the Theater of Public Policy is gonna take everything that we've talked about and bring it to life through entirely unscripted improv comedy theater. So without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our guest for this evening. She, she is best known just as the bird chick, but she has been a bird expert since 1997. She once said that her entire life goal was to figure out ways to go birding and get paid for it, which she has built an entire career getting to do. She is an author. She has worked for the National Park Service. She uh, uh, does 
a variety of bird field trips all over the country. Can you all please, in whatever space that you are in right now, make a big round of applause for Sharon Steitler, everybody. Yay! Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be part of such a very special episode. <laughs> I, I am uh, super excited to have you here as well. Uh, so Sharon, uh, we're talking about birds. Uh, and you are the bird expert. And so can you help me and just, I, I, maybe this is an overly simple question. What is a bird? Uh, like, and, and I, I mean, it's sort of a philosophical question. I mean, like, I know that like a sparrow or a crow is a bird, but right, like is a, well, a bat isn't a bird. So what no, is a bat is a mammal. like, this is a bird, this is not a bird. Okay, well, no one has ever asked me that before. So this is a fun question. So a bird is a vertebrate animal that doesn't have fur, it has feathers and it has wings. They generally fly, but not all birds do. And they also have a beak. Oh, they have to have a beak? Yes. Oh. Now the beak can be different shapes. It can be hooked, it can be long, it can be curved, it can be fat, it can be thin. I mean, there's there's all sorts of varieties. You're not destined to have just one kind of beak, but but no, they definitely they have to have a beak. Are there any things that would be a bird if they only had a beak, like they're just sort of short a beak? No, because they have to have feathers too. They have, oh, they do have to have feathers. Yeah, yeah, feathers, that's a distinguishing characteristic. Fur, if you have fur, you're not a bird. You're not a bird. No. So, so penguins have feathers? Yes, they do. Yeah, okay. This is and the like, other thing that's really cool about birds is birds have built-in conditioner right in the small of their back or what we would call their rump. So imagine like, you know, after you washed yourself and you wanted to like moisturize, you use a gland right above your tail and you squeeze that and then you rub it all over your body. I, um, nope, this is a family show. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to pursue that any farther. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so let's move on. Okay. So we figured out what a bird, feathers, beak. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to fly, but it no, wants. flying is not required. Yeah, but all birds want to fly, I assume. I don't think so. You don't think so? You think I don't think that desire is in all of them. I mean, for some like turkeys, have you ever watched a turkey try to fly up into a tree? That takes a lot of effort. I would think that turkey is kind of like, I really wish I didn't have to do this at night. I mean, maybe uh, there's a lot of things in life, Sharon, that we do that are a lot of effort and yet we push ourselves to do them. People, people are constantly trying to fly and the best that we ever get to is just sort of falling gracefully to quote yeah. a movie. So. Well, and there are some birds that falling gracefully is about as good as it gets. I mean, Kiwis, they really don't want to fly. Uh, they don't? No, they can't. And, and loons, our state bird, the loon, it is also hard pressed to fly, you know, whereas bald eagles have porous or hollow bones to make it easier to soar. Our state bird has very uh, thick bones and that's to help it dive and swim underwater. Uh, and their feet are way in the back of their legs. So for them to take off, it's a huge effort. They need a, a, a lake as a, as a takeoff and landing strip. I would think loons would be like, life would be so much easier if things didn't melt and I could just stay on one lake all the time. So loons, uh, our state bird is, in, is a thick boned bird. Like that's not even an insult, it's just true. Thick with two C's, my friend. <sighs> Got it, uh, awesome. Uh, okay, so we've uh, defined, oh, other fun thing about loons, I don't know, I, this is slightly tangent, but the one like sort of weird bird fact that I feel like I know, is it true loons never walk on land? They're only ever on the water and flying? Well, yeah, they cannot walk. Uh, their nests are usually kind of like on the edge of a lake shore and to get to it, they don't look majestic at all. They're kind of like just kind of pushing their body up and using their feet. Their feet are way tucked into the back of their legs. They can't even stand. And sometimes during migration, slick pavement looks like water and they get stuck on there. Oh. And if that happens, they, they need help to get back to the water. They and, and you also, if you ever find a loon in that situation, you want to be really careful. Never approach a loon without eyewear because they will use that beak to shank you. In the eye? In the eye, usually, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would rather grab a golden eagle than a loon. Re well, I think we, we all could say that. Uh, true. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, we were trying to think about what is really valuable for folks to know about this. And it's actually, we originally planned to do this show now because we're entering migratory season, right? Yes. So very, everybody knows birds fly south 
uh, in winter and then they fly back up here. We don't talk as much about the fact that they fly back up here in the summer. But so right now it's coming to be spring. So a bunch of birds are coming Yeah, like up. today I had my windows open. It was a beautiful warm day. And I heard flocks of tundra swans flying overhead and they're, they're not even gonna stay here. We're just kind of a stopping ground for them to carbo load. And then they're gonna go up to the Arctic and start making little swans. Oh, that's sweet. And so you could hear them. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a question that I, I realized I was going to ask you and I didn't prep you for it. But why do birds have songs? Why not? Good. Fair <laughs> answer. Uh, no, so that that is uh, a way for them to communicate. And birds, most birds generally do not have one just song or call. Uh, you know, there's the singing, like if you take robins right now, uh, robins have an entire repertoire and you can start to hear them do territory song. And so this time of year before they really had a chance to warm up, they have this kind of, I don't know, kind of like bitchy noise that they make in the morning and then they just kind of go chip, 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 chip. And they sound really irritated and that's their way of kind of doing a warm up. And then they do this beautiful kind of warbly call. And <clears throat> most birds when they're singing, that's usually them saying, Hey, it's my territory. It's pretty great. I'm a pretty awesome guy. If you would like to have some eggs fertilized, you should come hang out here. Uh, if you are not wanting to have any eggs fertilized, especially if you're a male, please stay the heck away. Uh, and then they also have chip notes that they use during migration to keep in contact with each other. And then a lot of birds have very specific calls that they give for different types of predators. Robins have this really high pitched down slurred whistle that they do. And whenever you hear that, if you notice it, you can, there's a Cooper's hawk nearby. And one of my favorite party tricks is in the summertime is when I'm at someone's cookout. If I hear that, I'll say Cooper's hawk is here. <clears throat> and 75% of the time a Cooper's hawk will fly through and everybody thinks I'm magic. That's uh, but you just gave it away is the only thing that I worry about. Uh, but that's fine. Now we all are going to do that. You can, all, you can all do it. It's it's like speaking French, only I speak bird. That's good. Uh, how would I say, um, uh, please don't poop on my car in bird? Um, you told me this was a family show. Yeah. OK, fair. OK. <laughs> so speaking of it being a family show, uh, let's try, oh, birds are migrating. So what, what should we be looking for other than the swans that you heard this morning that are just using us for our carbs? Uh, because, <laughs> so uh, waterfowl move through first, and then I have a sample of one of my favorite birds that are just coming back right now. <clears throat> and this is, this is a model of a woodcock. And they are coming back and they start their displaying right now. And about 15 minutes after sunset, if you go to an open field right next to woods, like Lebanon Hills Regional Park is a good spot. Carver Park is a good spot. You'll hear this really high pitch paint. So that's a really exciting bird this time of year. Uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to get native sparrows. So you can see fox sparrows, white-throated sparrows. And then towards the end of April, all hell breaks loose. And this is what birders really live for. And then that's when we can start to get warblers, scarlet tanagers, indigo buntings. And then early May, that's when we get the really sweet stuff. That's when ruby-throated hummingbirds come back, Baltimore Orioles, tanagers. It's, Wait, it's Baltimore Orioles, are we allowed to have those? Those aren't like just a... a Baltimore thing? We are allowed to have them. It's just that uh, early ornithologists were really terrible and lazy about naming birds. And so like one of the big mysteries of life is Tennessee warbler doesn't even breed in Tennessee. It breeds in Minnesota. That is confusing. Um, it, yeah. Connecticut warbler breeds in Minnesota. Not really in Connecticut. Do all birds, it sounds like all birds breed in Minnesota. Are we just like, you know, a love sack for uh, birds? For Midwestern species, for sure. But, you know, I think Alaska has us beat. Ohio's got a lot of kinky bird stuff going on, too. Okay. I'm going to dramatically steer this conversation back to a family-friendly place. Uh, I warned you. <laughs> if, we are, if we're desperate to, uh, uh, if we want more birds to be in our yard, what do we do? All these birds that are, or if, even if we just want to be good bird neighbors, because birds are the only people we're allowed to sort of be within six feet of these days. Well, I'm going to quote my friend Michelle Kalantari from the Nature Conservancy, and the number one best thing that you can do for any bird is to plant some nat native plants. Choke cherry, pin cherry, find out what is native, and that is the absolute best thing that you can do. And even if it's something that doesn't bear fruit, chances are good it attracts insects that birds like to eat. And you know, all those plantings we're doing for native pollinators, birds love to eat the native pollinators. So if you try and attract native bees, you're going to attract some birds because they're going to eat them. That seems like a very, I don't know, I feel like the, uh, we have done many shows before 
about trying to get the bees back to our yards. And now you're telling us, oh, this is all just uh, trying to serve the birds, like ultimately. It seems a little double cross on the bees. Well, you know, there's been a report about how we have lost billions of birds that should still be alive. And one of the reasons is they've lost a big chunk of their food and that's native pollinators. So yeah, bring, bring back the pollen, save the pollinators, save the birds. So, okay, so we should plant native plants. Yeah. What else? What, any other tips for like trying to help birds in our yard? Should we just go out and sing? <laughs> no, and actually that, that could violate some birding ethics. Um, Wait, actually, what? What, there's birding ethics? Yes, there is an American of Birding Association code of ethics that you are supposed to follow when enjoying birds. And singing to the birds is against the code of ethics, potentially? Especially if you're singing the same song of the bird during breeding season, because you can cause arguments. And then they might not bump the cloacas as much as they should. They might not defend the nest as much as they should because they're busy singing at humans. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I no idea. Okay. So I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was literally breaking bird laws uh, in doing that. So if I'm not singing, I've planted my native plants. Anything else I can do? You know, if you're building a new home or a cabin, try not to have a big gigantic window that birds are going to fly into. <laughs> I, when my friends are building cabins up north and they show like these great windows they're putting up, and I'm like, yep, about six months after that thing is complete, they're going to be emailing me asking me what they can do about birds not hitting their windows. Uh, so, so that's a, that's a big thing. Um, don't let your cat outside. Uh, <clears throat> and if you have a cat and you let it outside, that's, that's really bad for birds. I don't care if you think your cat's not killing birds. It is. I don't care if you have watched your cat grab a bird and the bird goes away. That bird is dead within 24 to 48 hours because the saliva is toxic to birds. Oh, that's um, bad. if so you have a cat and you insist on letting it outdoors, do not have a bird feeder. You're the worst if you have a cat outdoors that kills birds and you have a bird feeder. Oh God. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I, so let me, okay. I'm going to be totally honest about this, sure, sure. which is that I do have a cat. Mm -hmm. I only let it outside on a leash. That's with, fine. Leashes are fine. Leashes well, are I'm pro cat on a leash. Okay. I will say even on the leash, the bird has, the, the cat has gotten a bird or two, but I always feel like I don't know, bird, like bird, if you're gonna get all the way down on the ground next to the cat, who literally is like tethered to the ground, I, there's only so much I can help you with, bird. So actually, I feel like this is on you. You're actually the one that, that killed the bird and not the cat. <laughs> because the cat is your responsibility. And you know, we have young birds in the summertime and some of these birds nest on the ground and they're basically like 15 year olds with a learner's permit while they're trying to learn how to fly. And then there you are with your with your cat just running into them and, and eating them up. You should be more respectful to the youth learning how to fly. All right, all right. I'm gonna, George and I will have a conversation when I get home for today. Uh, uh, right now you and George are the equivalent of the Viking Stadium. So let's talk about the Viking Stadium because when we announced that we were going to do this show, that was like the number one thing people wanted us to talk about. Viking Stadium, when it was built, and ever since then, people have been talking about, we put up this giant glass thing for that is going to just like attract birds for them to hit. Right along the Mississippi River, which is a gigantic flyway. <laughs> okay, so, it, and it's because it's right by the Mississippi River, so there's a lot of birds going uh, right by this way. I. The only counterpoint that I've heard from people is like, well, don't all buildings kill a lot of birds? Uh, is this building particularly bad at killing birds? The reason why this building was so upsetting was because the Vikings, had the, the people building the building, they had the money to do, uh, to get glass that would minimize the amount of birds that could hit the stadium and die. And they chose not to. And they chose to do all these other things. So that was what was infuriating. Yes, it's a building that's killing a lot of birds. Yes, we already have buildings that are killing birds. I guarantee almost everybody watching this program has a house that has killed some birds. We need to stop that. And we need to, to get people to start minimizing birds hitting buildings. We all need to do our effort. But the Viking Stadium was just an example of, yeah, we could have done something. We had the money for it, but we're just not gonna because football. Fair. Um, I mean, terrible, but uh, not good. Uh, I so we are. Uh, I'm going to just say soliciting questions on Twitter. For oh, folks, uh, I for can folks. see one. Uh, somebody on Twitter did want a clarification 
uh, the term that you use, bumping cloaca, what is it? Cloacas. Cloacas. What is a okay. cloaca? So most birds, uh, their reproductive organs are cloacas. Uh, very few birds actually have a penis or a vagina. Uh, so for most birds, when they mate, they're literally bumping uglies. Okay, I don't and know. And it just has to hit like a little bit. And, uh, you know, some birds like goshawks, they will do it thousands of times, thousands of times a day because, you know, it's, it's hard when the female's on a branch and she's balancing and then the male has to get on top of her and balance and then they have to get the tails lined up just right. And so you just need like a little and then hopefully that fertilizes an egg. It's not nearly as exciting as ducks or cassowaries. No, wow, I, 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 no, I mean, we've all been there. Uh, so I don't know if I wanna talk about ducks or cassowaries. They're just like, they're horrible with mating. Is there a way we can talk about how they're horrible with mating and yet keep this family friendly? Um, I don't, <laughs> so, when, when uh, a, a, a male duck is it's in the spring and it, he's feeling his hormones very much, um, he has to get to a female. And a female who, wants, who has some eggs and wants them fertilized very much, ducks just have bad communications. They all just kind of like come together all at once. And sometimes there can be several males coming for a female to offer to help her out with this whole fertilization thing. And she's kind of overwhelmed by choices in the males. And the males just are like, just try us all. And so the males can get kind of aggressive because they, they have something that kind of looks like rotini or spiral macaroni. And uh, they can just kind of slip it in there. But the thing is the female can kind of choose which male, she's like, oh, you know, this one that is really more aggressive than the other males might be the one that I like. And so I have a lot of pockets inside me and I'm gonna show him the pocket that has an egg to fertilize. And all the other guys are gonna get empty pockets, but they don't know. Yeah. Is that okay? okay. So ducks are terrible creatures. That's what we've uh, established, but um, not- Sexual warfare. Not our cast member, Duck, uh, who is a wonderful person. Um, it's just the, the creature's ducks. So, I think we can ask CJ about that. Yeah. Uh, no, they don't I, have any kids. OK, so uh, we talked about getting your yard ready. We've talked about uh, migration patterns. Um, and we talked about a lot more than I intended to about uh, bird mating. Oh, this is the theater of public policy. So the last thing that I'll ask you about before we turn it over to our improvisers is that um, there is a there's actually a big public policy issue right now around bird migration because people may not know we have laws and treaties around bird migration and trying to protect birds that are crossing all these international boundaries. And yes. uh, there is some movement right now in our current administration to maybe roll back some of the protections uh, around bird migration. So can you just, what what is that law that exists now and what is sort of the Thing that is being debated. Yeah, so the, it's a law with a crazy name. It's called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And there's that, and there's also the Bald and Golden Eagle Act. So essentially, you are not allowed to harm any native bird that's not a game bird. So we're not talking turkeys, we're talking um, northern cardinals, blue jays, that kind of thing. You are not allowed to remove their nests, eggs, feathers. Uh, you're not allowed to have them in your possession unless you have a permit. I have a, I do have one of these permits. But if you're a third grader and you pick up a blue jay feather on the ground, that's technically illegal. Now, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is not going to go up and, and round up all the third graders across the country with a blue jay feather. But what they use the law for is it's really hard to prove poaching. Or let's say somebody wanted to construct something, but there's a pelican colony on the property. And the, they can't build next to the pelicans. And as long as the pelicans are breeding there, they can't do anything. So let's say they just go in one night and destroy all the nests. And then the next day, people are like, what happened to the pelican colony? Oh, I don't know, coyotes, I don't know. So if you have any of the bird pieces on your possession, it's, it's a way to prosecute you. So it's hard to prove poaching, but it is if they so then what the authorities can do be like well you're not supposed to have all these pelican parts in your house so we're gonna pr prosecute you for that good and okay. so, so i i should uh, get rid of my stash of pelican parts uh basically uh, but then you don't have a permit i would i would yeah yeah uh and then um but then but maybe i shouldn't because they're 
they're, what are they talking about? Are there some movement to like make it so that I can keep as many pelican parts as I, my heart's desire? Well, it's also too, like, let's say you want to build a whole bunch of wind turbines right along the Mississippi River. And it's like, well, you know, we got some bald eagles that nest there. The bald eagles might hit it when they're learning to fly. So the administration wants to ease those rules. So it's like, oh, you accidentally killed a bald eagle. We're not going to prosecute you for that. Just make sure to tell us when you killed that bald eagle. It was an accident. And, and so we need to have these laws in place because we need to have construction that allows for us to live with birds and not drive them out. That is a beautiful note uh, to end on. And so what I'm gonna do right now is even though it's virtually, I'm gonna ask everybody to do a big round of applause for our amazing guest Sharon Settler, everybody. Hey, okay, that was fantastic. Uh, oh. Uh, nobody can see you uh, with the, the binoculars except for me. Uh, so anyway, um, what, what are we going to do now? So right now, we are going to turn the camera over to the cast of the Theater of Public Policy, who you can see here now, who are going to attempt to do improv, again, from the safety of their own homes. They are miles apart from everyone else uh, and very isolated and secure. Uh, this is very new and experimental for us. We are super excited about it. Uh, my communications person texted me to remind me that we have a donate uh, capacity on both our Twitter and our Facebook and a whole bunch of places. So uh, if you can and you're capable, please uh, go and, and make a donation during this uh, on our, uh, put a donation on our Patreon. Uh, or on our GiveMN page. Uh, but uh, while that's happening, while you're making these gifts, I'm gonna turn it over to the cast of the Theater of Public Policy. All of them, including Sharon, are, are muted, except for the, now they're gonna do uh, a scene. So please, a big round of applause wherever you are uh, for the Theater of Public Policy. <laughs> Whoa, hey, I'm sorry. I am sorry. You are singing my song. I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a Tennessee warbler and I, I, I didn't realize that, that that's an actual song for people in Tennessee. I've never been there. Oh, I, I mean, I, I like it a lot. Um, I, you sing it so well. I, I'm a Baltimore Oriole and I didn't know you knew any of our songs. Oh, I love Baltimore. I mean, because you, when you land in the harbor, it's, you know, like a, a, a swift descent. We, we are quite athletic, I know, I know. Wow. But look at you, Tennessee yeah. Warbler. Yeah. Um, who knew we would ever meet like this with you? If you sung my song, I guess, hey. You know, I, I'd be kind of happy to hear you sing my song. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I don't know all the Tennessee Warbler songs, but I do know that refrain. Oh, please, I, I'm dying to hear it. You are. A burger, burger. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's buku, 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 buku. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know all the lyrics. I've never heard it from um, an actual Tennessee warbler before. You just insulted my mother. Oh, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Um, I would like to apologize the traditional way a Baltimore Oriole does. Please go ahead, go ahead. Home run! <laughs> Yay. Sup, brah? How you doing? My bones are so thick. They're so thick and strong. But you have little teeny weeny bones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you got to say about that, huh? I don't have bones at all, Carl, and you're well aware of that. And it hurts my feelings every single time. Samuel, I think, I think that you need to figure out a way to get some bones, okay? Now, now, I, I think we could go get a deer carcass or something. And then, and then after, after we eat the deer carcass, you could, you could take its bones, give you some- I Long, some strong support so you can walk and be out of the water. 
See, at first I really thought you were talking metaphorically, like I should get a backbone and get bravery, but apparently what you meant was kill an animal and shove its in, uh, bones inside of me? Yeah. That's, that's kind of gross, Carl. It's kind of gross, I'm gonna be quite honest there. Um, not really sure that we should hang out anymore. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm no, please don't go. I, I really like you. You're my friend, even if you don't have bones, I just, you know, I hear, I hear people bullying you all the time and, and I don't like that. I, I just, I just want to help you out a little bit. I used to get bullied. I know what it's like. My God, you're a true friend, Carl. A true friend indeed. Come here, give me a hug. Yeah. I, I'm I'm the good cop and oh, and um, you, I'm the you, bad cop um, as you can see here. You, look, look, we just want to talk to you. You're a vicious psychopathic murderer. I know, I know. Officer Cooper knows what you've been up to. I know, I know. It's fine. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. I didn't I didn't lick any of the birdhouses. I swear to God. I don't know. I don't know. What do you say, officer? Officer's getting upset. You know what? We're going to have to take you in because you are an outside cat and we want inside cats. Look at my face. You're so could... cute and we're going to have to take you in inside. You're just no. going inside. You're not going to prison. You're not going to jail. You're going inside. Look. I don't want to go inside. I don't want to eat kibble. I don't want to play with plastic balls that have little jingles in them. I don't want to scratch up a sofa. I want to kill. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Listen to me, kitty. You know what? You can cause mayhem inside. There are curtains you can get tangled up and pull off the wall. You could sit on people's lap while they're trying to have a Zoom meeting. You could eat the dog's food and the dog won't know what to do. You can cause just as much craziness inside, Kitty. That inside. sounds like heaven. You've got this, Kitty. So come on inside, and Officer Cooper will show you the ropes. Okay. Ouch. 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 It's not working. I guess if I believe, maybe it will happen. Well. <laughs> Hey Carl, uh, they, they, uh, so they asked me to do a thing here at the, the zoo to just kind of name all these animals that don't have names yet. Do you mind helping me out with that real quick? Yeah, I'm, I'm great uh, with names. Great, great. So there's this bird over there that uh, exists only in Texas, uh, mates in the Midwest, uh, and has never once seen Japan. What do you think we should name that one? I mean, it's obvious. You got to go with the Tokyo Warbler. Okay, that's a good idea, that's a good idea. That sounds real good. Sweet, uh, so over there, there, there's a turtle that uh, grew up in Egypt, um, studied abroad in Cairo, uh, and has never once stepped foot on European ground. Duh. What do you think we should name that one? I mean, it just comes to me, John the Baptist. It's a turtle, oh. water, come on. It's real good, it's real good, it's real good. Sweet, 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 sweet. Okay, okay you so gotta give there. me a hard one. These are so oh, easy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Great school stuff, great school stuff. What am I doing? Uh, okay, so uh, over there, we got a giraffe, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this giraffe has actually lived on all continents and studied in the North Pole for quite a while. What do we name that one? What do we name that one? Ooh, when I asked for a hard one, I didn't think you were going to name the giraffe. I know, oh, it's geez. a tough one. It's been kind of everywhere, hasn't it? But, Except for space, of course, but we would never name it anything after space. Well, I mean, we? it, it, it's just come to me. We're going to call it Moon. The Moon Giraffe. Yeah. Sounds good to me. This is why they call you old, really good at nicknames, etc. It's a long nickname. Banana <laughs> 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 Hi, fellow ducks. I'm glad that you all showed up for our communication circle. 
Hi. Hi. I, I, I don't know what you're saying. I'm sorry. It doesn't make any sense to me. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, what? Hello. Maybe another duck wants to help out here. Uh, hi, how are you? I'm good, good. Thanks for coming to the communication circle. I know that you have trouble sometimes making yourself understood. Uh, that, uh, that is that is absolutely true. Uh, you know, oh, I, I have such difficulty with this long bill. Sometimes people think it gives me a little bit of a pompous way to communicate. Well, you know, in some ways, people's impressions of us is just a projection of themselves. Oh, oh so you think that they're pompous? <laughs> oh, I laugh and eat caviar. <laughs> I wonder if there's another duck who wants to join our circle. No. Um, oh, I can go. I can go. No, 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 no. We're so glad. Please, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. So, stay. that tell us. Um, you, I remember that you said in your uh, your uh, fill in your your uh, form that you signed up with that you uh, sometimes put people off by maybe being just a little bit aggressive. Is that? Is that? Oh, well, that's just a. I mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mean. I don't like people. I'm a duck. Well, um, yes, but you have to get along with them, you know. Oh, 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 I'm a lone duck. I don't want any of those other ducks ducking around me. I want to be alone on this lake by myself. Why don't you practice having a little dialogue with the pompous duck and see how that goes? Maybe you can work something out. Okay, sure. Thank you, professor. Oh, I'm very pedantic. Why, hello there. How are you doing today? I don't want to talk to you, other duck. Oh, oh, you know, it's so it's so nice that you know your station, but it's okay. I give you permission to talk to me. Oh, see, this is why I don't want to talk to any ducks. This one's got a bow tie on. Come on, get back in the lake and swim around, but don't get in my lake because I'm going to stick my head and eat all the stuff underneath the water. But to be why fair, do you claim to the whole lake. The lake should be for everyone. Uh, I'm an introvert duck. I want to be alone and I want to patrol and I want to paddle around now, and I it, don't want It looks like we have another duck who wants to join the conversation. Hi. Uh, uh, sorry, real quick. Is this a support group for people whose looks like red rotini? <laughs> Yay, we'll meet next week at Oh, 10. so, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll go. Honey, I just got back from the doctor. Oh, really? What did he say? Well, I finally went through with that elective surgery. The one I've always been talking about. The one you've been dreaming about this entire time and I've been completely supportive of? I've always felt like I would just be just a more responsible partner to you if I had a cloaca. Oh, so, uh, oh, not, so not the one we talked about then. Um, well, the, no, the, I mean, I, the, I did have that mole removed from my back, but I was going to be there anyways. Oh, and I thought, you know, why not just get a cloaca here on my side? Yeah, yeah, like you mentioned, um, and, Still not entirely sure what I'm supposed to do with that, um, but maybe I'll figure that out a little bit later. Um, I mean, it's just meant to be fun. You don't have to do anything. It, I mean, what do birds do with it? Come I on. don't really know. Apparently they just like hit them or something. I don't know. I'm not a birdologist. I, I mean, you don't have to feel threatened. I'm not gonna, you know, marry a swan. I married you. I actually hadn't thought about that until you just mentioned it, and now I've never been more concerned about anything in my entire life. But I mean, um, think about it, it's so handy. I mean, you always complain about having a lack of moisturizer. Oh. There's a moisturizer right here. Oh, oh, well, okay, well that does, that, that kind of helps a little bit. I, I, maybe, maybe this won't be so wacky. Um, here, let me, I'm just, I'm just gonna reach over and I'm gonna grab a little bit of that. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, this is, this is, I don't, I don't actually like this. I'm sorry, I was gonna try. Um, I mean, it's always weird the first time, but I think this is something we can get used to. I mean, I no longer have to take out my pants to go to the bathroom. I just could cut a whole flap in my shirt right here. You know what? 
if it makes you happy, I'm sure we can figure this out. Yay. Thank you. Hello, it's me, John the Baptist. I want to know if I can keep all of these bird feathers that I have. I have feathers from an African penguin. I have feathers from a turkey vulture. And I have, I have feathers from a snipe. John, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I have to arrest you. What? No, please don't be putting me in the jail. John, you're what going to jail. That? Those are all crimes. Those are protected. You can't oh, have those. Oh gosh, you scared me so bad, I'm pooping. Oh, John, ugh. Oh, jeez. Well, what do I do? How do I make amends? What if I bring my cat inside? Will they forgive me? John, if you bring in your cat, everything's forgiven. You'll save a countless amount of birds. Oh, well, well thank you. All right, I'll even, after I put the cat in, I'll even put out some bird seed and, and sing them some songs. How, how about that? If I just sing them, sing them some songs? John, I thought this was the worst day of my life. I've never thrown a turtle in jail before. <laughs> but you've made it so I don't have to. Well, gosh, thank you. I, I, I really, I really, I'm not made for the big house. You know, you know, it's such a scary, it's a scary and dangerous place for, for a tortoise to be. Thank you. No, Welcome inside. Come downstairs with me under the stairs, huh? Oh, oh, oh. No, that cat's gonna get me. That cat's gonna get me. It's gonna be fine. turtle uh which is fine it's good i'm sure the turtle consented and was happy about it and delighted so thank you so much uh so we are going to bring our guest back here in just a second um but first i wanted to do a couple uh quick things so i already uh did this at the top but i do want to say i am uh here at uh the bryant lake bowl the beautiful bryant lake bowl theater where we normally host our shows which is uh closed right now but as I noted at the top of the show, you can support them and it would be fabulous and wonderful if that you did because we want the Bryant Lake Bowl to still be here when we are allowed to come back and do shows in person again. So if you go to the Bryant Lake Bowl website, there are ways that you can buy really cool swag. Like I just bought this hat uh, that I'm going to wear, uh, not right now, uh, but then uh, other times. And then uh, you can even just donate directly because they are trying to make sure that all their employees stay on their payroll and are insured. Uh, but obviously, because they're not doing any business, they need your help to do that. Uh, at the same time, we want to say a big thank you to our other sponsors, MinPost and, uh, and Finnegan's Beer. And we would love if you would support all of them. And then I uh, probably I'm a bad business person because I put this last, but you should also support us. Uh, there are these ways to donate for our uh, GiveMN page and our Patreon that are linked on our Facebook and our Twitter and all these places right now. So uh, it would mean a lot to us if you would chip in a little bit to support us, maybe just the cost of what a ticket would normally cost, which is about 12 bucks uh, to pay for tonight's performance. Because, oh, this is true and this is totally real. And I want to say this. We are paying all our performers for uh, the show tonight just the way we would if we were here. That's very important to us because there's tons of artists and performers right now who are just out of work. And the only way that we're all going to still be here uh, when we get through this thing is if we support each other right now. So we are making the commitment to support and pay for our artists right now. And we would just ask if you can 
to also support us doing that. So uh, with that, I am gonna bring back, can we do a big round of applause, uh, bringing back to the virtual stage, our guest, Sharon Stiller, everybody. A big round of applause, Sharon, are you still there, I hope? Sharon, are you muted? I am just unmuted. Oh, good. Yay, Sharon, so there. All right, so fantastic. So excited. I assume we got everything right in the improv part. Um, it was 100%. You know, I have to say, the bird naming segment was very cathartic for me. Good. Uh, all right, fabulous. OK, so uh, we have been getting questions from folks. Via, Can I answer them? That is the idea. So we have been getting questions. And um, if anyone watching right now has a question, Please just tweet them at us if you're yes, following us. Totally on into them. I love this. This is my favorite thing to do on public radio. Yeah, exactly. Or uh, if you are on the Facebook and you want to just comment on the Facebook Live, you can ask a question there. Uh, if you have my cell phone number, you can text me. Uh, so uh, the first, and then Destiny, who is our communications person, is collecting all these and sending them to me because she's not here either. Nobody's here. All right. So. Uh, the first question that I got, oh, this is actually a question for you, Sharon. So you have devoted your life to birds, your vocation. This is your passion. Do you remember, the question is just, uh, what fascinates Sharon most about birds? Everything. Um, <clears throat> no, when I, was, when I was a kid, I saw a Peterson field guide and I was just fascinated. And when I learned that there was a woodpecker that was crow size, I, I was hooked. And I mean, the hours that I spent alone in my bedroom as a kid poring over bird books and like looking at gorgeous pictures of birds and like just just like the way like the beak will like blend into the feathers. I mean, I just I, I love birds. It's the way I'm wired. I, I, I can't help it. And like even right now when things are weird and everything's awful, I, birds bring me a lot of comfort. And uh, you mentioned a Field guide? A what field guide? A field guide to birds. It was the Peterson field guide to birds that I saw when I was a kid. And I just snapped. I was totally head over heels in love with birds. Birds are my first love and uh, uh, th that's never gone away. That's beautiful. Okay, so uh, I think that Cass has some questions, but I just have a couple more first from uh, the Twitter, which is, uh, okay. So somebody wants to know, oh, this is actually a very practical question. Uh, are there birds of prey in Minneapolis that could potentially pick up and carry away a six pound dog? Yes. Uh, that said, your dog is far more at risk of coyotes than it is birds of prey. But um, if your pet is under 10 pounds, it is at a very slight risk of great horned owls or a bald eagle or a super desperate, starving, confused red-tailed hawk. But the bigger danger with a pet that's under 10 pounds is coyotes. Okay, so coyotes are the real enemy, but um, yeah. I didn't realize I should be as afraid of owls as I, I thought I was. Great horned owls are the badass of the bird world. Um, they, they're not that heavy in the grand scheme of things, like three to four pounds, whereas your average bald eagle is, in Minnesota, they average about 10 pounds. You know, eight to 12 is, is where the range is. Um, bald eagles cannot carry more than half their weight away. But great horned owls will consistently kill things heavier than they are, and they can carry their own weight in food. But it's it's really rare. Um, I would only be worried if I had a pet that was, um, like if I had a pet rabbit for a long time, that's fair game for birds of prey, so I'm not gonna let that run around unsupervised. But you know, if your cat is super young, super old, super stupid, it is on you to make sure they don't get eaten by all the predators that live in the Twin Cities metro area. I feel like the tables have turned all of a sudden. All of this seems like it's on me, whether the cat eats a bird, whether the cat gets eaten by a bird, like. That's true. Your pet is your responsibility. I thought we were in a relationship. Uh, <laughs> okay. It is. It's just I got kind a, of an abusive one. I got, a, I got a question from somebody who has my email address. Uh, they emailed in Sandhill Cranes. Oh, MFG, I have a Sandhill Crane tattoo. What? Oh. You I want to see it? You can see it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> where can we see a Sandhill Crane other than your tattoo? Well, number one, right above my backside. Um, but no, Sandhill Cranes are migrating through right now. 
and uh, uh, some of the best places to see them generally during the, the breeding season, which is going to be now through November, Crex Meadows, Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge, Aiken County. Uh, in the last couple of years, they have tried really hard to breed in the metro area. Last year, a pair tried to breed over by Lilydale Park. People were trying to keep it on the down low, but that's a big bird that makes a lot of noise, so it's hard to keep it on the down low. Uh, a couple of years ago, they tried to breed at uh, Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge at the Old Cedar Avenue Trail bike bridge. So now's, now's a good time. Um, I live on the border of Minneapolis and St. Louis Park, and, and I periodically get them in migration stopping at a wetland uh, not too far from the Whole Foods. Okay. So can, you, can you just help us like sa sandhill cranes? Like mm -hmm. are they, what can you, uh, say? Say, like a, I, I'm trying to imagine like sandhill crank like big and like a, it what's it uh, what is it I don't want you to have to take your shirt off so well oh, no it's not that bad okay oh wow this is something that normally would never happen on our show oh that's beautiful yeah that's good that's good it was designed so, by the world's authority of sandhill cranes Dr. Paul Johnsgard in Kearney Nebraska all right and so that's the bird that's trying to mate here in yeah, it's a matter of time. I mean, they're they're a they're a. I mean, I went to Homer, Alaska a few years ago, and bald eagles and sandhill cranes are the two most common birds in that area. And so, if bald eagles are nesting next to the 35W Bridge in downtown Minneapolis, it is a matter of time until we get sandhill cranes here. Great, I look forward to it. Um, okay, I am gonna again turn it over to uh, the the cast in just a second, but I have questions from children. And I can't ignore. I will not show any of my endangered species tattoos to children. Please. Uh, so uh, I just got this text. A four-year-old asks, what do peregrine falcons eat? Mostly birds. Uh, peregrine falcon. What's the word for cannibal and bird? Peregrine falcon. <laughs> 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 Cooper's hawk. Um, no, peregrine falcons, their full name is the duck hawk because they eat a lot of ducks, especially like green winged teal, wood ducks, uh, blue winged teal. They love pigeons. Um, they eat quite a few night hawks. Um, but yeah, I would say 90% of the peregrine falcon diet is other birds. Wow, that's dark. Um, there was a follow up to uh, the peregrine falcon, or sorry, no, no, the, the uh, Sandhill Cranes question which is just, what is the sound that they make? And I don't know. I, I'm terrible at doing Sandhill Crane, but my phone is amazing at it. So um, Sandhill Cranes, they have a really long throat and they have a syrinx, which makes it so that they can sing two notes at the one time. And it also makes it so that they can uh, be super loud. So here is what a Sandhill Crane sounds like. Wow. Very dinosaur-like, I would think. I think that's what something a, a sound a dinosaur would make. That's very cool. Um, somebody asked, uh, why do birds tap on my window? They don't like you. Okay. No, <laughs> no um, in all seriousness, um, when the sun reflects on your window, the birds can see their reflection. So during breeding season, they think it's a rival and they want to fight their rival. And because the sun, it will hit your window at a certain time of day, the bird gets on a schedule and it's like, you know what, every day at 10 a.m., this jerk shows up in my territory and I have to fight him. So I'm going to go down there tomorrow at 10, maybe 10.05, and just kind of fight him. So um, you have to kind of block their reflection for a few days to get them out of the habit of fighting with themselves. You kind of need to be their therapist. Okay, so you should just try and meet them where they're at. That's nice. Yeah, uh, pretty much, okay. yeah. Uh, uh, cast of the Theater of Public Policy, you all have been wanting to jump in uh, with some questions. So uh, do, do, do one of you want to jump in with a question here? Yeah, um, uh, so I'm curious, Sharon, about uh, how the, the border wall impacts uh, the birding areas and the things that happened down uh, in Texas? Well, it's pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, the border wall is, um, it, it's it's bad. It's it's one of my, the, the area down in Texas, especially the Rio Grande Valley, that is one of my favorite places to go birding. I, I will go there anytime I can, and it's a wonderful area. But there is some very unique habitat down there uh, that hasn't been developed. And you get a lot of species that uh, 
just kind of come up from Mexico are species with very limited ranges. And so the border wall is going to rip up that habitat. Even worse is it's going to be problematic when the Rio Grande Valley or when the Rio Grande River floods. And some of those animals like oh, ocelots and tortoises that would normally kind of run away, they're going to find that they're trapped by this border wall and the flooding river and they're going to drown. So the border wall, it's not going to keep people out. It's terrible for the habitat. It's terrible for the community down there. That's one of the best communities I've visited in the United States. And it is a waste of money. Okay, well, we definitely got some policy in there, which is fun. Um, we uh, got a question uh, from a seven-year-old. Uh, Lena asks, how many bird species are there in the world? That is a great question, Lena. And it's, it's challenging to answer because ornithologists are constantly changing species definitions and they're lumping species and splitting species. Do you know it's possible that we may have six different species of nuthatch in the United States alone? Um, I'm, I'm gonna just say, yes, I did know that. Um, Oh, someone's been keeping up with the American the Ornithologist uh, Union. The only thing I make sure that I read each week, Nut Hatch, Nut Hatch Digest. Anyway, you were saying. There's roughly, there are roughly 10,000 species of birds in the world, give or take. Um, that, that, that's a generalized rule. Are we trying to, are, are we making new birds? Should we be making new birds? Um, yes, but we should also not be forgetting all the birds we're getting rid of oh. accidentally on purpose. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, what, d Cass, did somebody else on the cast have a, a question that they were gonna ask and uh, jump in here? I, I do, uh, just a quick question. Um, I grew up next door to the Hughes family and it was uh, Beth, Julie, Melinda, and Mo. And the people next door, they had a minor bird. The mm -hmm. forms had a minor bird and the minor bird learned how to say, here's Mo. Um, how do certain birds learn how to speak in human language? That is a really great question. So if everybody can just feel right here, we have a larynx. So we have like one big tube right here. Birds have two tubes and they can do a lot of different things with that. And it depends on the type of species. So mina are in a kind of similar family as starlings and they're mimics, similar to mockingbirds, but kind of their own species. Uh, and parrots are, are another bird that can do that. So they have this ability to mimic sounds that they hear and they use that to attract mates. Um, there's the lyre bird that a lot of us saw on Attenborough's Life of Birds and that's the bird that could mimic a chainsaw and camera clicks and car alarms. Um, so it, they just have different equipment and so they don't necessarily know that they're talking. They're just repeating a sound that sounds fun. And that particular bird learned that, wow, when I say that people pay attention to me and talk to me and I get to be the center of attention and sometimes I I get treats and that's how that happens interesting um i've got another question a very localized question somebody who lives uh in the loring park part of minneapolis wonder, oh, i'm familiar with that uh what is the deal with a hundred thousand crows sort of like like flying all around loring park uh especially during the winter what's their deal that means crows feel safe and warm and comfortable. So in Minneapolis now gets this crow roost. And so traditionally crows will all roost together in the winter time. They'll come from tw a 20 mile radius. Uh, and so tr it's usually been out in the middle of nowhere like around farm fields, but farmers don't care for the crows so they shoot at them. So the crows have learned that people tend to just shoot at each other in Minneapolis and not at other crows. So they, they like being in a metro area. There's ample food supply because people do not close their dump dumpster lids. And also in urban areas, uh, they tend to be a few degrees warmer than in rural areas. So crows love to sleep here in the winter time. And that once breeding season kicks in, though, the crows kind of go off and do their own thing. Fair. Um, I did, I, I have somebody who is asking, uh, sorry, hang on. Uh, oh, this is going back to the cat's piece. So if a cat does eat a bird, which we agree shouldn't, they shouldn't do, we're going to talk to them. We're gonna to talk to the cats and try and explain they shouldn't be eating these birds. But if they do, are they at risk of like getting sick? That's a good question. Generally, no, they're not at risk of getting sick. I mean, they might barf. Uh, they, you know, they might get a bout of diarrhea, 
Uh, but cats, you know, I think if cats are going to get sick, it's usually because your cat is roaming the neighborhood and someone gets irritated with it and decides to give it some antifreeze. I mean, I'd be more worried about the weirdo in your neighborhood or the coyote than I would be about the, the bird that it ate. Okay, I've got a really fun question, and I don't know who it's fun from, uh, but somebody just wants to know, do birds hold grudges? <laughs> yes, against your window. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I would say birds hold grudges and they especially hold grudges against things like Cooper's hawks, peregrine falcons, and great horned owls. So, so have you ever noticed like when a hawk is in the area or, a, or an owl is there and then crows, I've even seen chickadees, mobs, smaller owls, they hold grudges against other birds that eat them. Wow. Okay. Um, so this is kind of brings us to the last question I was going to ask you. Uh, and, and there's a related question from the audience, which is, you know, uh, somebody noted here that they've got a sister-in-law who is terrified of birds. And then, so they, they were wondering if you have words of advice for maybe being less terrified of birds, but maybe they put a more positive spin on this. I mean, you love birds, like this is your passion. So, you know, for those of us who either are terrified or maybe are just like, oh, birds, whatever, like uh, help us like feel your passion. How do we like, what is it? You sell us on birds being this amazing, wonderful, beautiful thing. Okay. Number one, I've almost been kneecapped by a goshawk. I've had a robin fly into my face. I've had a house wren practically go up my nose. I Sharon, had... Sharon, this isn't helping. This is not this is not selling us on birds. I've had pelicans vomit on me and give me the second worst parasite I've ever had. And oh. I still love birds. <laughs> Birds are amazing. I want you to think about things like if you see a hummingbird in early May at your feeder in Minnesota, you need to know that that hummingbird in its life has crossed the Gulf of Mexico at least twice, probably more than that. Uh, birds are amazing. They are a treasure hunt. We can search for them any place, anywhere. They move, they change color. Uh, Birds have so much to teach us. They're an important part of spring and summer because they contribute to the soundscape that's in our backyard that we associate with family and fun. Birds are amazing. You don't have to love them as much as I do. You don't have to get barfed on by a turkey vulture to know how cool they are. You can admire them from afar. If you're scared of birds, you, you shouldn't be because I've been attacked by many birds. I've been bitten by birds. Heck, I've been footed by a red-tailed hawk. It doesn't hurt that bad. Bees are worse. I was Neil Gaiman's beekeeper. His bees did way worse damage to me than birds. So uh, if you're looking for a tagline from this show, it's birds, not as bad as Neil Gaiman's bees. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, no, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Sharon. This has been fabulous. Uh, what we're going to do now, I'm not going to take any extra time to just turn the stage over, the virtual stage over to the cast of the Theater of Public Policy, who you see is all standing by, ready to go one more time. They are going to improvise via Zoom conference based on just what we heard from Sharon. This is all made up on the spot. It is all improv comedy, just inspired by our conversation about birds. All right, please, wherever you are, make a round of applause that we can hear where we are for the Theater of Public Policy. Hey there, pretty bird. Oh, hi, that's, that's really nice of you to say. Uh, can I, how, can I, how, can I, how can I help you? Well, um, you know, I'm just a little worried in these times, you know, uh, 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 I mean, I'm a liar. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Robin. And uh, sometimes, sometimes things get scary for me, you know, and, and I was just wondering if you could help me out with maybe five dollars so i could catch the bus downtown oh well, i mean yeah it sounds like you're in pretty dire straits here so yeah i'd love to just, just give me two oh, seconds awesome. uh, yeah yeah there you go oh thank you thank you so much um i really appreciate um, your honesty and your truth here it's yeah, very sweet yeah, 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 yeah. Is there, i mean because uh because a, a robin like me who's definitely not a liar bird uh yeah. Uh, Thank God. I was a little bit worried for a second. For all of my little chicks, you know, I have nine chicks at home to feed. Oh my. 
could, could oh, you, a lot of do you have any more money maybe so that i can you can help me feed my nine chicks at home <laughs> poor guy nine chicks how could i even oh, oh thank, thank such you. an honest oh, robin oh, too i'm so sorry here you go oh, oh. is there anything else wrong yeah, that i can yeah. help with um i gotta tell you that that i that i've been investing in in the in the the well-being of this city and i've built i've built uh uh community centers uh for lots of people to go to but times are hard if if you had some money for a poor measly little robin to 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 build some community centers that might be uh pretty great oh good you know what just take my wallet actually real fast yeah what does a camera sound like Gotcha. Oh, God, no. Oh, gosh, darn it. Get, get it. Get stuck to me. Got to get, 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 get out of here, bird. Get out of my yard, bird. Yeah. Oh, you think you're so tough. Good. You show up every day at 9.15, but you know what? You know what, bird? I'm the bird of this neighborhood. Heather, 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 Heather. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's just, it's just a window. It's, it's. Oh, it's, oh, it's just, yeah. oh, it's just my reflection. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You've been mad at yourself for such a long time and. Yeah, I just, I didn't realize. I just thought it was another me that showed up and I got really aggressive because I don't want a second version of me anywhere. <laughs> Believe me. Oh, I mean, I get it, but. But you, you got to forgive yourself. I mean, think about the little hatchling that you once were. Think about it. Little, I was a little hatchling. And yeah. People no, take a, out for me. And, but you know what? I, I don't want other birds showing up in my area. Well, I can understand that. But take a good look at yourself. Go on. Go on. Okay. Get out. Get out of here. Oh. Get out of here. Get, get, get out. Stop. Duck, I'd, I'd like to apologize. My my great horned owl, it swooped down and grabbed your cat out of your backyard yesterday. I'm so sorry. Fluffers? Yeah. It got fluffers? It, it, it got fluffers. I mean, part of this, it's responsibility on you. You put the cat out there. My cat died and you're talking to me about responsibility right now? I mean, what am I supposed to do? Keep an owl cooped up inside? I don't have room to, for it to fly around. It needs to fly and be free. Look, I mean, I mean, my name is Duck. I'm terrified of great owls because, you know, just like, just like those, just like, you know, the falcons and everything, they just might do me in. So, so I don't have any sympathy for them. I'm, I'm you know, sorry, but my cat? that's your responsibility too. I mean, it's not like a loon. It's not going to go after the eyes, but I mean, if that owl knows you're a duck, and I should say it does know you're a duck, it's gonna go after you. So, so what am I supposed to do? You know, just stay inside? I'm not prepared to stay inside for like weeks or months. How well, does one stay inside for like weeks or months? I, I tell you what, in preparation of this conversation, I knew it might go like this. So I prepared an eight gallon vat of oatmeal. That'll get you through a couple of weeks. We can find out where you can move to after that. Frankly, oh. you're just not good for this neighborhood. That owl is going to get you sooner or later. You know what I mean? What do you mean I'm not good for this neighborhood? I mean, it's like it's a buffet me. next door. That that owl just kind of looks at you and sees lunch. Yeah. Well, maybe I just need to get some thicker bones myself and tell that great owl what's what. Because it's oh. not kicking me out of my house. Oh, no. No, you should have seen what happened to the last person who talked trash to me. John the Baptist. That's right. No. No more. Yeah, I sent him down to the Grand Rio, the Rio Grande Valley when it flooded. And now he's now he's singing another tune. I, that great owl's gonna sing another tune too. I had no idea. I you know what? I'll keep the owl inside. Or maybe I'll move. You know what? I'm going to keep the oatmeal. Wait, you it's to... your owl? 
If it's your owl, that means it's your responsibility. Well, I mean, let's not point fingers here. You know, that's not exactly, you know, that's kind of rude. Yeah, I'm pointing, know? I'm pointing right at you. See, look at this finger pointing right at you. Don't you point that finger at me. I'll point I'll this point finger, this at, finger you. at you if I want to. All right, I'm looking at you. You know what? This scene is over. Welcome to Loring Park. Oh, hey, thanks. Uh, I'm just kind of looking for somewhere to be. I just flew in from the old farmstead. Ooh, well, I would love you to hang out here. You know, we do a lot of cool hangouts. Sometimes a whole murder of crows shows up, and other times we get sandhill cranes, you know, keeping busy. What a diverse populace you have here, but I'm not sure that I'm quite sold yet. You Ooh. got any food around here? Oh, you bet we do. Sometimes a food truck pulls up and they sell hot dogs and then we can eat the crumbs or snatch them out of somebody's hand. My God, it's utopia. Welcome to Loring Park in Minneapolis. Wait a second, what's the catch? Um, well, the, the, there is no catch, it's, it's paradise. Um, it's a small pond and sometimes people come by and, and it's perfect. What, what are you suggesting? I'm just saying, you seem awfully suspicious and welcoming of this land of milk and honey. Oh, I mean, not, not at all. I mean, I, I just want more birds to be here in, in Lauren Park and to take more birds. And in fact, I'm running for, for bird governor. So hello, nice to meet you. Uh, oh, it was a political game. It was a political game the entire time. You lied to me. Vote for you me. You lied. Vote for me. Please. My votes are always voting for it. I'm a honeybee. Well, I'm Neil Gaiman. How are you? Pretty good, but I'm pretty vicious. I've taken all of your personal information and started my own checking account. Wait, you did what? I did. Bees are the most awful things on earth. So I've emptied out your checking account and now I'm gonna go down to Mexico on a plane. How could you do this to me? I made you hives. I gave you a place to live. I planted beautiful flowers for you. I got a really intelligent bird expert to like help me maintain you. You put 14,000 drones with one queen. I didn't stand a chance. Oh, can you, can you please? There's a lot of money in that account. I'm sorry, Neil. As Soon as this is over, I'm gonna fly over and I'm gonna sting you right in the back of the neck. What if, what if I gave you all the residuals I get from Coraline? Can I just give you that amount of money instead of all the rest of the stuff that I have? Keep talking. All right, so, so we've got Coraline on the table. Um, maybe we throw in some, the first season of Gods and Omens. Like I'd still keep it if we do another season, but the first season you could have the residuals from that. I want something on Netflix. I, I, I I don't really have much on Netflix right now, um, but maybe, uh, you know, I've been toying around with optioning this Sandman into a series. Maybe I could give you a piece of that action. Nah, Neil, I'm sorry it had to end like this. No. show for this evening. I, uh, I am so happy to have gotten to do this weird, wonderful, beautiful thing uh, with all of you watching at home. I want to do another really big thank you to uh, our amazing sponsors who have helped. Uh, they signed up to support us before things turned totally weird uh, and crazy. Uh, I, uh, I'm getting questions, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a bird now. This is my bird costume. 
can people not see that I'm a bird costume? So, um, I'm a crow. So, uh, so thank you all so much for watching at home. Uh, I am just absolutely thrilled. If you enjoyed any part of tonight or uh, you uh, just want to support us for trying, please, we would be so appreciative, honestly, sincerely, if you made a donation on our GiveMN page or our Patreon, which is an ongoing support mechanism. Um, it would mean a lot to us and it would help a lot. Uh, thank you so much to the Bright Lake Bowl who hosted us uh, for right now, where I am here uh, all alone, other than our amazing tech person, Barb, who did this lighting to make my crow costume look good. Uh, so please visit the Bright Lake Bowl website, support them. Thank you so much to Finnegan's for being our fabulous beer sponsor. Go buy some Finnegan's beer uh, and sponsor and, and help us uh, support them. And thank you so much to Min Post uh, for uh, being our media sponsor. And uh, without further ado, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our cast who this evening have been, who's our cast? Duck Washington. Brandon Boat. Heather Meyer. Chris Rodriguez. Jim Robinson. Dennis Curley. Hey, everybody. Dennis Curley and our guest for this evening. A big round of applause, everybody. Sharon Stigler, everybody. Yay! A big round of applause. Okay, thank you all so much. This has been so much fun. This is so weird and wonderful. Honestly, if you like this, please send us a note and tell us that you did. Uh, send us something to say that we should do this again or not. Probably, hopefully you would send us a note to say that we should do it again. Uh, because we want to know. It's the first time we've ever done this. It's super weird and wonderful. You all are great. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will uh, hopefully see you in person again very soon. Until then, be safe, stay at home, uh, wash your hands, and have a wonderful rest of your night. All right, thank you, everybody. Good night. I remember when we were young. Good night.